Alrighty, we'll go ahead and get going. We are close to time. Let me just tell you, I am so happy to be here this morning. Um, if I sound a little hoarse, I promise you, I feel worse than even I sound. Uh, we had, uh, but that's not indicative of the camp week. We had a fabulous week. Uh, you're welcome to come ask me, but I'd really rather you go talk to Hayden Powell, go talk to Kenzie Ibbotson, go find Ethan Bramlett. Um, those are kids that came with us from Gold Hill, and uh, we actually all got to be in a cabin together. Didn't plan it that way, just worked out that way. And, uh, but we had over 120 kids, about 80 staffs. So we were right at 200 folks, and uh, we had a, just a phenomenal week. Um, always come back physically, just wrung out, but spiritually about as as full as I am any point of the year, and, and today is no exception. So we'll try to nurse my voice on through, um, through Bible class and then worship this morning. But I'm going to make a little bit of an audible, and I'll just be honest with you why, because my brain is working at 30% might be generous at the moment. And Mark 5, uh, I want to deal with next week, because Mark 5 is a unique one. You're familiar with this story. Jesus deals with a, a demon-possessed man. That's not the unique part. But he ends up, you, you've, you've heard about this story where he asks what the, what the demon's name is. He says, that my name is Legion. And they have multiple um, come out into pigs. And the pigs run off into, basically commit, <laughs> commit pig suicide and run off a cliff. And um, I know you're going to have lots of questions. Good, 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 good questions. And I don't have the capacity to answer them this morning. So we're going to jump into uh, Mark 6. We're just going to swap weeks. Not that Mark 6 isn't relevant and, and, and full in its own way, uh, but it is ever so slightly lighter than chapter 5. Um, I know Daniel did a phenomenal job um, last week covering Mark 4, um, and we are going to try our best to um, dig into Mark chapter 6. So let's read. Uh, if somebody would, I'm, I'm going to rely on you all heavily this morning to read for me because otherwise I don't know if I can preach. Um, Mark 6, I'd like to read verse 1 down through verse 6. Would somebody read Mark uh, 6, 1 through 6? So basically, Jesus is, is heading back home, right? I mean, he, he's doing a hometown tour. This is still, in a way, it happens today. If something big happens, I know anytime anything significant happens back home in Kentucky, sports, um, academics, anything, people want to do kind of a parade through their hometown. This happened in my hometown, probably happened in your hometown. Jesus was doing not for the, for the glory, but he, he was going back home. He was heading back to Nazareth. Now... Why is it that he received, some of this is opinion, some of this is we have some indication via the text. Why did he receive the, the welcome or lack thereof that he did? Why, why, why was his hometown responsive to him in, in the really negative light that we see it in Mark 6? They, they understand his humble background. They've, they've, I mean, he's in his own country. This is, sure. this is people that knew him when he was growing up. This is people that knew his parents. This is people that knew that he did not come from royal lineage. Yeah, I, I, I think that's as much it as anything. They had a hard time getting past the idea that, I mean, I mean it says it in the text, is this not the carpenter's son? I, I mean, is this not the guy that we have seen grow up? It, how could this be? And, and really, think about this. I, I like to parallel these two ideas. 
they have a unique perspective that very few have. They saw Jesus grow up, and there was really only one group that can say that. Um, but what it a lot of, if there was a, a Jewish person that was going to struggle with, is Jesus really the Messiah? What was primarily the reason that was cited as to, could this really be the guy? What, what did they most often struggle with, a Jewish person? What were they expecting? A king. A king. I mean, they, they have had it pitched to them and told to them and regaled them with the story of the Messiah coming. And he was going to be the next David. He was going to be the very next warrior king that was going to break them out of the oppression that they're in. And really, the, the Nazarites are, are, are not a lot different in the sense that it was all about perspective. It was all about expectation. It was all about the way they were viewing this. Other Jews were looking at Christ and saying, we want you to be a physical king. We want you to be an earthly king. We want you to be a warrior. We want you to be strong. Jesus was the opposite of all that. They're looking at him and saying, you can't have the, the power and, and everything because we've seen where you've come from. And so again, it's all about this difference in expectation. Now, let me jump down quickly because Jesus is going to, it says that he did no mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people. Now, you would think that Jesus would have wanted to do works there to prove that he was who he says he was. Remember, we've said this many times, the works, the miracles, we're going to talk about this a little more in our sermon this morning, are, are not the purpose of why Jesus came. The works, the miracles were, were really to affirm who he was, his identity, his lineage, his power, preaching, teaching, saving was his primary purpose. But again, they're having trouble grasping the fact that he's the Messiah for different reasons than other people. But you would think that a, a miracle would have been called for here. I mean, if anybody would have benefited, you would have think it would have been the folks that were struggling with Christ's identity. Why was it that he didn't? And again, we don't know exactly. I'm asking opinion. But w why wouldn't he have done a miracle here? <coughs> yeah. That's it. I, I, I think Christie's hit the nail on the head here. He already knew the heart that they had. He said, it doesn't matter what I do. There is no way that they are going to believe what that I am, who I say I am. They, they in a sense, seen too much, right? They, they, they've got so much background of, you know, you, you might liken it to, you know, think about early on in your career, you worked with a certain group of people. They have seen you as a younger person. Fast forward, you don't see them a long time. You come back. Chances are they're going to see you as they last remembered you. Um, even if you've advanced 20 years and, and done bigger and better things, a lot of times folks will keep you where they originally saw you. right? And I think that's what the folks in Nazareth were, were doing. They remember Christ as a teenager. Well, one section of Christ's life that, that we have very little insight into is, you know, growing up in his, you know, youngest years up through, we have a little bit in his teenage years, but then big gaps until he starts his ministry in his late twenties, early thirties. They have all of that knowledge and they're, and they're kind of struggling with what to do. Now you notice that he, Jesus says, okay, I'm not going to do any of the miracles. I think for, I think we've already identified why that was. He says that it, it, there's, there's, it would almost it would almost devalue the miracle because he says, I know that they're not going to believe, so I'm not going to do it. But what does he do? He doesn't say he's going to do it. He just goes and does it. He says he does a few small things. He lays hands on a few sick people. But then what does he do right at the very end there? He was marveled because of their unbelief. We'll talk about that in a second. But then what did he continue to go do? To teach. And where did he go? Some of the small villages, you got to remember back in the first century, every, and Nazareth was kind of a mid-major, I mean, not, not a large, large town, but it wasn't a tiny, tiny village either. Any semi-decent city is going to have, you think of it like a hub of a wheel. It's going to have a city, and it's going to have all these little villages that are around it that all kind of meet up. And then ancient, the ancient world, if you look at maps from the ancient world, it's basically like wagon wheels all over the place. 
because you'll have within different regions, you've got major cities and then you've got these little villages that all kind of feed into this one. And then you've got a bunch of those littler cities that all feed into like Jerusalem, for example. So when um, different things happen, everybody kind of converged on these, on these huge towns. So you notice, and this is the last point we'll kind of make here, but Jesus, you know, Paul talks at times, he says, if, if, if you encounter resistance, if you encounter, if you, if you tried and tried and tried and you just can't make any progress, what does he say? What, is, what does the New Testament tell us if, if you've tried over and over and over and you just don't get anywhere? There's one phrase that, that gets brought up. Dust off your feet. Dust off your feet. And, and I like to bring this up a lot of times because I think we assume that Christ is going to, and, and we don't assume, he is the very best teacher that the world has ever known. He has every ounce of skill that would be needed. I mean, I mean, he's Christ. But he still wasn't capable, this is not because of his fault, but he still wasn't able to convince them that who he was who he says he was. He wasn't able to change their hearts. What does that tell us in a 21st century context? Christ was going back home and was not able to convince them that, hey, I've got a message you need to hear. I use it in my life. Is I always think it is very hard is to convert your own family members. Yes. And a lot of times, like, it's so frustrating because I think your family members sort of look like, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. Sure. And... And, and I always sort of think about this and think, well, you know, even Jesus, the people who knew him best, he, that's the people that he had trouble converting, you yeah. know? Yeah. And our own family members, I think, a lot of times it can be the same scenario with those very closest to us. I think that is a spot-on observation. If you couldn't hear Karen, she, she, she made a great point that a lot of times those closest to us can sometimes be the hardest to... Um, certainly convert to even talk with, right? And there's a myriad of reasons why that might be. But, but the, that is a great thing to remember in the back of our minds. But I also want us to remember that, you know, again, we, we know Christ had every advantage. He, he was God on earth and he still was not able to get to everybody. Now that doesn't mean that that gives us just a free pass of, well, if Christ couldn't do it, I'm just going to stop. But what it does give us some sense of comfort is that, because I think every one of us have somebody in the back of our minds that we've just, despite repeated efforts right now, we've just not gotten there yet. And, and it can feel discouraging. It, it can feel like we've just had our you know, balloon pop because we're just, we try and try and try. I always point to this story for multiple reasons, but even Christ himself was not able to convince everybody. Christ himself was not able to prick the hearts of everyone to get them to see. And I mean, he was, there is no closer. I mean, he, he is, he is it. And he, and, and still his hometown was resistant. They didn't even hear anything because they were like, no, no, no. We know the source. We don't want it. Yes. No. Uh, what I unfortunately think of when I read this story is, um, you know, since it's all about me. Right. That people are actually rejecting me, not Christ, not the Word, not salvation. But I internalize it and think this is, you know, a rejection of me. Which, of course, it couldn't be less true. Sure. And uh, what Marcy said, if you couldn't hear it, was that it feels anytime we engage in spiritual discussion, and I don't know if it's because we know what's at stake, but it feels even if it isn't meant this way, it can feel very personal of, you know, that, that they, they are rejecting me and my faith and what I believe. And, and even Christ to a degree, now this is a little bit of an inference, but we look in this and, and it says he was marveled at their, I, I, I really think, and this is, this is a much larger question than we're going to get into, but how Jesus reconciled the earthly with the deity, right? I mean, there's, there have been people that have dedicated their lives to trying to figure out how Jesus managed the 100% man, 100% God. How did that work in his mind? I think this gives us a little bit of an insight of he definitely knew their hearts, but I get some sense here that this was not the reaction that he expected, at least not to maybe this degree. 
I think he knew to a sense, like, you know, they're going to have a hard time seeing me as what I am now because they've seen me what I was before. Um, But it says that he he was marveled at their unbelief. And so, like Marcy said, I I think to some degree we all feel when it's our own, when it's our people, right? When it's the people that should give us all the credit in the world, um, sometimes they don't. Rocky? I think to some degree it's also showing a prejudice common that we can find ourselves getting into too if we're not careful. I mean, what did it start off with in verse 2? They were astonished at his teaching. How, basically, how, how does he know all of this? He's just a carpenter. Sure. And we can look at that kind of concept today where we can say, well, he didn't go to a Christian university. He doesn't have a degree. He sure. didn't go to a preacher training school. He can't know that much about the Bible. Sure. And yet, they, they missed the point that they should have saw that, you know, he was He's God himself. He was inspired. He didn't need to do the training. But we can fall into the same prejudice. I mean, people can teach themselves the Bible and know a whole lot more maybe than somebody who went to a school that has a piece of paper on the sure. door that says, you know, I went to school to learn this. And it's a similar type of prejudice that we have to watch out for today. I think that's a great point. Uh, if you couldn't hear Rocky, he said, you know, I- to some degree, perhaps some of the the hesitancy and the prejudice, as Rocky put it, that some of those in Nazareth might have felt is that, again, I, I, I hear it a little bit in the, is this not the carpenter's son, right? This guy, he, he, he's not a priest. He's not from the lineage. He's not a Levite. You know, all these kind of things that you might normally expect that they would have said. And Rocky brought up a good idea of, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to fall into a similar prejudice of, you know, if, if the source is not what we expect it to be in the sense that, you know, we want teaching to come from a traceable lineage, right? To come from the school that we expect it to come from. Um, and we kind of go all that way. So sometimes, as Rocky put it, folks can study themselves and come to a greater understanding than, than even some that have studied for, for a long time. Um, and and that's, there's a little bit of the, uh, you know, we look this week at camp a lot about the Holy Spirit. And, and we know that one of the roles the Holy Spirit places is unveiling truth in, into the life of those that are looking. Yeah, Christy? To, who do we see as authority? Mm, yes. Like Karen mentioned, I mean, my mom sees herself as an authority over me. Sure. Therefore, I can't teach her anything. Mm, yes. I can't impart any wisdom right. because I'm not the authority. Right. And I think sometimes we view each other as, well, you're not the authority on this, so... Why and should I we, care? We, you know, our society doesn't view teachers as authority, doesn't view police officers as authority, mm. you know, because they don't view God as authority. Mm. It's an authority issue. That is a great point. I, I, I hadn't written any of that down, but if you couldn't hear, a lot of what they're struggling with here is considering the source and, and view on, on authority, right? I mean, they very clearly did not view Christ, and I think we've already identified why that was, as the authority on, on spiritual matters, right? He didn't have the, the lineage. He didn't have the degree. He didn't have the background, so they thought. Who, he's the carpenter's son, right? He's the son of Mary. Can't be. Um, and and Christy brought up the great point of, you know, sometimes we struggle, even today, modern example of folks that think, you know, a, print, a, a parent relationship is, is what Christy cited. I think that's a perfect one for us to consider. Um, or, or even somebody that's relatively new to the faith, we might be inclined to think, you know, they've only been a Christian for six months. You know, how, how are they going to teach me on whatever it might be? Uh, but, but I do want to guard us against that. Uh, you know, certainly consider the source. I mean, that, that does help kind of weed out stuff. But, but also consider that multiple times, I mean, we've already had this discussion. If you look back um, in Mark chapter 3, when, he, um, when, when Jesus kind of sends out some of the original apostles, we talked at length about that they were ordinary men. They, they were ordinary folks that came and but had an extraordinary message. What if, and I'm sure they did encounter this to some degree, but what if everyone had that view of, isn't this the fisherman? Isn't this the tent maker? Isn't this the fill in the blank? 
we would have a very different outcome than we see. But, but folks looked at this and said, is there truth in what's being said? R- regardless of the, the connection between the teacher and, and those being taught. All very, very good points. Anybody else have any thoughts on one through six before we continue on? Yes, Bob. Just another way of saying what has been said already. I can see as people listen to Jesus in the village there that they consider him either a fake or a show off. And right. When he done a miracle, it would have been some kind of trick. But maybe in Jesus' mind, one thing that might have been somewhat comforting is that in a few short years, they would see all of this come together and explain and whatnot. Sure. But to us today, we can't wait a few years for something to be revealed because it's all in the Word. Yeah. So it was a little different. Yes, yes. If when the Christ, the chosen one, returns again, right? How? What will you expect? What will you? What will he look like to you when he is revealed again? Mm. Will it be what you expect? Probably not. <laughs> that's a that's a, that's a, I think that's a, a great question to ask in the sense that when Christ comes back, um, when judgment happens, what's going to be our as you as as was already laid out what's what's our expectation but beyond that what's what is our feelings on that i mean and that's that's a much larger question of are we ready for judgment are we excited to see christ in whatever or or, or are we going to dread that because we don't have the relationship we need to I, i think that's an important important question um and then of course you know even even we could we could look into that further um but yeah, before we jump on, and then we'll look into Jesus sending out the 12 and then the death of John the Baptist. But, you know, Bob brought out the point. He said, you know, Christ to a degree knew what was coming, right? He knew that there would be in a relatively short time frame, all of his hometown is going to hear about the crucifixion that's about to come. And his resurrection will eventually circulate back around. So I, I, I do think there's probably at least a part of Christ that says, I don't have to square this away today. Because I know that it's going to be handled tomorrow in, in a figurative sense, right? And so, so, and then at the very end of verse 6, and he went out among the villages teaching. I think that is an important emphasis to be made. Because again, even, even in this circumstance where he's frustrated to a degree, he's marveled at their unbelief. That didn't stop what he was there to do. He basically said, fine, if, if Nazareth proper is not wanting to hear what I have to say, well, there's villages that might be receptive, right? And so he then continues on to these little smaller outlying villages. And, and in a very real sense, we have a, a very similar responsibility of we pick, and this is the parable of the sower, we pick the, the soil that we think is, is going to be most profitable, Right, and to a degree that there's there's probably as much art as there is science to that of, of finding where we think seed will be best grown, right, in terms of spiritual seed. But sometimes we're wrong. Some sometimes we we cast seed in places that it's just not growing, and that may mean that it just needs longer. It may mean that it's just not right now. It may mean that it's not good. We're not the ones to sow that seed. There's a lot of reasons why it may not happen. But the parable of the sower even points us to some degree of the idea of you and I have to be continual sowers, right? We, we, we can't stay in one location so long that we end up losing all opportunity to do work, right? And, and some, I mean, even from, uh, think about from a farming perspective, if you have a plot of land that, you know, you've put seed in for, you know, three seasons, and you just haven't had anything come out of it, despite, you know, you've amended it, you've tilled it, you know, you've put all the stuff you need on it, and nothing's happening. Any good farmer is going to look at that and say, well, maybe it needs time to rest. Maybe it's just not good today. Maybe we haven't had enough water, it needs more water, maybe it needs a different kind of seed. But all of that's going to amount to, maybe I need to rotate my field. Maybe I need to jump over to this other plot of land for a time and, and cast seed there. And I think that's an evangelism principle that we have to consider from time to time. And again, I'm not saying, you know, jump ship super early, but after continual repeated exercise on our part, there comes a point where even like Christ, he says, nothing's going to come from here, right? This plot of land is barren at the moment. That doesn't mean it'll always be that way, but at the moment it is. 
So I'm going to go find these little outlying villages, perhaps smaller in size, but more fertile down the road. And, and, and that's, the, like I said, there's, there's a lesson to be taught just in that alone. Now we look in, we jump into verse 7, and, and we don't have enough time to get through all of, of Mark chapter 6, unfortunately, because there is, and we may spend two weeks on this, there really is some good stuff here. Jesus sends out the 12, um, and we've already looked at this to some degree, so we're going to actually just kind of gloss over, but he sends out the 12 to begin the, to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Now, one thing I want you to note there. Um, what that means, uh, and we'll talk a minute about why he sent them out two by two. But there's two things with our understanding of the Holy Spirit. So with the Holy Spirit, and I'm far, far, far from an expert, uh, but part of this we talked about this past week at camp was the roles of the Holy Spirit in the first century. Um, and the, the Holy Spirit did two very important things, and you'll read about it as baptism of the Holy Spirit is probably most often the way you reference it, Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius comes um, and the Spirit comes and basically gives him the ability to speak in tongues and that signals the Gentiles being allowed into the body of Christ. Uh, that's a really important thing. The other time we see that happening is with the apostles. The Spirit comes and gives the apostles, and, and, and we call it kind of the upper level name for it, is the apostolic um, gifts or the apostolic ministry, because there is a very particular role that these original 12 are going to play in the formation of the church. So, and this is not the, the, this is not exactly where this happens. The spirit comes at, at a later time, but when it says that he gave them authority over the unclean spirits, remember that Christ is imparting a special measure of ability to the original 12, because he's basically extending them out as an extension of himself. And, and again, it would be a much larger discussion to talk about, well, does that continue on to other people? And, and the short answer to that is no. Um, there, there, was a, there was a need that had to be met here that's going to cease in about 100 years uh, when, the, when the church is finally up and going. But he sends them out two by two. He gives them authority over the unclean spirits. Essentially, he gives them a supernatural ability to perform miracles. Not everything that Christ can do, but certainly a portion of that. And it's for the same exact reason that Christ himself did miracles. To affirm who they say they are, right? So they're going to come into these regions and say, hey, I'm here on behalf of the Messiah, on the Christ. And they're going to say, prove it. I don't believe you. And then they begin to do miracles to say, here is the lineage. Here's the power that I'm here through. And this is going to not always work, but by and large, be kind of like the green light to say, okay, this is really who they say they were. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. Now, a little pause. It seems like a weird distinction. Why tell them specifically not to bring anything? I mean, they're going out on this pretty long journey. Um, and, and most of them, it's going to be a long time, if ever, that they make it back home. I mean, the, most of them, well, all of them are going to die, essentially are going to be martyred for their faith. Some, it takes longer than others. Um, why not bring anything? I think there is one central reason why Christ says, don't bring a thing. That's it. I, I think it all boils down to dependence. He says, where is your dependence going to lie? It's not in the coin that you have. It's not in the clothes that you have. It's, it's, it's not even in the staff that you have. It is in the God that you are proclaiming. It is the Christ that you are teaching. I mean, in, in essence, it is an object lesson that he's doing right here without ever saying it. Right? I mean, he is teaching them on faith with zero words other than don't bring any of this stuff. He says, rely on the Father. If you... If, if, uh, and he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you depart. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. And then they went out and they began to proclaim the gospel. So again, lo lots of lessons here, but I want us to just kind of jump ahead. Um, John the Baptist is about to die. Now, again, I want to kind of spend a little bit of time here. Uh, what was significant... We've talked already about this to a degree, but um, what would be the significance of John the Baptist dying? 
Yeah, Bob? Well, he had some pretty strong followers. Yes. Sort of, you know, removed, removed any obstacles as far as Jesus. Yeah, I, I think that is spot on. If you couldn't hear Bob, he said, but even when Jesus had entered the scene, remember John was the forerunner of Christ. So in, in a great way, John had prepared the way. John was beating the drum of Christ to anyone that would listen. The flip side of the coin is that John was fairly charismatic himself and had a, a pretty large following. I mean, certainly in the earliest days of Jesus' ministry, John's following was significantly larger than Christ. I mean, to the degree that people would continually reference John's apostles, John's ministry, and Christ's apostles, Christ's ministry. And they would kind of try to cross over of like, well, is this the same as John's or is this different than John's? But one of the real significant things that happens, and we'll kind of summarize this next week when, when I've got time to pull all these verses. But the real significant thing that happened here is now John is leaving. John's about to die. And as negative as that is, what it would really do is kind of refocus the whole region on, okay, John's gone now. And John himself was trying to say, I'm not the guy. Here's the guy. Christ is here. The Messiah is here. You know, you, you can follow me in the sense that I will help teach, but I'm just going to point you to Christ. And so when, when John died, it really kind of refocused all of the, but it was a real significant hurdle that the first century would-be Christians would have to face. Because there was a lot that really viewed John as the guy. And they're having to figure out, oh, John's gone. What am I going to do about all this? But of course, Christ steps in. King Herod was the one that ultimately put John to death. Um, and again, we're, we're going to come back to, this This week's going to be a little bit sporadic just because of being at camp all week and things like that. But we will come back to, I want to make one point next week on there. Let's jump into verse 30 because this is one of Jesus' well-known miracles. Jesus is feeding the 5,000. You have heard this story, I am certain, multiple times. But I want us to read this. Um, this is not unusual for Christ. He is going into an area. Um, and I'd like to read this whole thing, and that's basically going to uh, take our time, and then next week we will touch on, just I'll give you this reference before I forget about it. Next week we will jump into Mark 5, um, the, the healing of the, the demon-possessed man. We'll look briefly at Jesus healing Jairus' daughter, and then that's all of chapter 5. And then we'll jump into the death of John the Baptist, and then we'll kind of be back up to speed. So it's, it's basically going to take me two weeks to teach a week and a half worth of stuff just because of camp and stuff. Anyway, um, let's start in verse, would somebody read Mark 6, 30 through, and this is a longer read, so uh, bear with me, somebody, uh, 30 through 44. I want to read this whole uh, little chunk here, and then we'll comment on it, and that'll be our time. And the apostles gathered, in Jesus, gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. And there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude. And was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all set down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them, 
and the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men. Thank you, Mark. That, I know that was a, that was a lengthier read, but um, but th this is a, this is a extremely well known story within Christ's ministry. You can reference it in other gospels as well. Um, but basically, they're coming into a, a, an area not unusual for for Jesus. The apostles had returned; it had gotten late, um, and they were coming, and they were they they saw a crowd. And again, not unusual for for Jesus, as we've already looked and identified in in the Gospel of Mark. But it says Jesus had compassion on them, and, and Jesus was, you'll notice that it explicitly says that Jesus was teaching them all along. So even before we get to the physical side, we recognize that the spiritual need was being met, right? So we look at the, the feeding of the 5,000 often as this, you know, champion story of Christ meeting a physical need. And, and it is, I don't, I don't want to misunderstand, he does meet a physical need. Um, but he has already begun to meet the spiritual need. And, and that, again, is the priority in Christ's mind, is this is what I'm here to do. Now, what? let's identify this really quickly. What was the difference in the way the apostles were viewing the way this evening was going to unfold versus what Christ was? What, what is the apostles, he says, okay, Christ, it's getting late. What do the apostles want Jesus to do with the crowd? Send them out. He, he says, send them back into town and, and, and let them go buy their own food. Basically, we're all going to cover ourselves. I know it's late. I know dinner has to be eaten, but send them away. And, and I can almost hear a little bit of like, you know, we're hungry. We want to We want to go do our thing, right? We want to meet our physical need. Um, but Jesus, of course, kind of turns this on his head here. And, and, and he says, but he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them? I mean, he's saying, are, are, are we going to go spend this small fortune on bread to feed, you know, 5,000 men? Most commentators would tell you somewhere between 12 and 15,000 people, right? Because when it says 5,000 men, you can essentially read that as 5,000 families, more than likely. Um, women and children wouldn't have been counted in, in stuff like this. So 5,000 men was 5,000 patriarchs of families. Not that they all had to have wives and kids, but most of them probably would. So we're talking about, I mean, a small arena worth of people. That This is not, this is not a Gold Hill size audience. I mean, we're talking about thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And Jesus is looking and saying, no, no, no. we're going to feed them food. We're going to feed them supper. And he says, Lord, you don't understand, we don't have anywhere close to this amount of food. We, we, we can't possibly do this. And, and one thing I want you to, to note here, because this, this piece of imagery is something that Christ is going to identify over and over again. And we've already talked about it to a little degree this morning, and it's all about expectation versus reality. What is possible with Christ versus what isn't, right? And so they're looking at Christ and saying, Lord, we physically don't have the means to do this. And Christ is going to reiterate the point that if I'm here, you have the means. And that's going to be a point that he's going to reiterate over and over again in a physical way. But he's also going to reiterate that in a spiritual way. Because there's going to be multiple times that they're going to say, Lord, how is it possible? Um, you know, Peter, I, I hate to, to knock on Peter, but Peter was, was pretty racist back in, in, in the first century. In the sense that he did not want any Gentiles welcomed in. And in fact, we're going to look at that briefly at, in our sermon this morning. Peter, if you look in Galatians chapter 2, he wouldn't even eat dinner with, with, with a Gentile. And Christ is essentially going to, because Peter's going to say, Lord, they're not part of our people. They're, they're not Jewish. They're not, you know, they're not with you. They can't be part of the group. And Christ is going to say, listen, if I'm here, all of it's possible. If I'm here and I'm, I'm saying that it's clean, God's going to give Peter a vision when he interacts with Cornelius. And he's going to see all these wild game and birds and reptiles. And he's going to say, Peter, arise, kill and eat. And Peter's going to say, Lord, I, I can't. You, you know I can't. I, 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 that's unclean. I'm not going to do it. And the Lord basically says, if I've deemed it so, if I've deemed it clean, then it is clean. Don't say anything that I've given the green light to is not. 
And, and, and again, this is something that Jesus is going to have to reiterate over and over again because they're constantly looking at the physical and the spiritual saying, Lord, we don't see how it's possible. We just don't see how it can work. And Jesus looks at him and says, how many loaves do we have? Let's, let's at least identify what we have. He says, go and see. And they found out and they said,